Welcome to part three of the Heathkit AP1800 preamplifier series. In part one, I told you a bit about the history of Heathkit's Pro Series components, and we did an unboxing of our new old stock, 40-year-old unbuilt kit. In part two, we built the speaker selector, input selector, mode selector, power supply, and moving coil boards. If you missed those episodes, you may want to go back and check them out. In this episode, we'll build the two largest boards in the preamp, the main circuit board and the control board. Plus, I'll show you some useful tips along the way. One of them's a little weird, so hang in there for that. Let's begin. I told you in the last video how much I like this PC board holder. So before working on the main board, I figured I'd show you how it works. Here's the main board we'll be working on. To install the board onto the holder, the first thing we want to do is spread the two ends apart so that it's the correct distance for our board. The ends slide along this metal piece. Let me loosen it like that. And when you have it at the correct distance, you just tighten the knobs like that. So let's see, for our board, we're going to need to Oh, this isn't gonna work at all, is it? Let's see. Will our board fit this? That's not gonna work. Wait, I have an idea. Okay, you call that a PC board holder? This is a PC board holder. So today I wanted to get going on putting the main board together, but since it didn't fit the PC board holder, instead I've spent the last couple of hours putting this together. And basically, this setup will allow me to use the parts from the old PC board holder to now accept much longer PC boards like this one that we'll be working on next, the main board for our kit. And all this is really is a piece of board and a piece of steel that I've polished up a bit to lay on top uh, with holes cut at half inch increments. And the way this will work is take our old setup and instead of using this piece of metal here to align the two ends, I'm gonna set that aside. And as you can see, now I can place these at half inch increments all the way up to here, more than enough to do the PC board that we need. And actually, the board that we're gonna be working on after this is actually a little bit longer even, and uh, this setup will allow me to work on that board as well. Now, when I first got the idea to put this together, I had no intention of having this metal plate here, but I decided it would be a good addition, and here's why. Oftentimes, I'll want to quickly solder something, and I don't want to use clips to hold it in place. I just wanna get in there and quickly solder the two parts together, and that's why I keep this piece of ceramic tile around so that I can quickly solder something like this without worrying about burning my bench. The tile's starting to get pretty junky looking, so I figured, hey, why not add a piece of metal so that I could use the surface for soldering as well. And additionally, it's a nice big surface and I can just sort of lay my soldering iron like that without worrying about anything or even placing my desoldering iron on it and not having to worry about it burning something. Let me put these aside now and I'll show you how the end pieces attach. So the way these end pieces came, there was a rubber foot here and a rubber foot here and rubber feet on these two sides as well. What I've done is I've actually removed the rubber feet from the stands and I've used them for this board. You can see here, here, and here. And these were the screws that held the rubber feet into position and they screwed into, this inserts into that piece of metal and from the bottom this screws in and holds the end piece in place. Let me show you. So you can see, imagine that like that and imagine the rubber foot here this screw would go through and it would screw into this piece of plastic. So we're not gonna use these small screws. And instead, I have these larger screws. And what we'll do is we'll take the screw and I have a washer for each one. And these are wood screws and they will screw right into the plastic piece like that. Let me show you. Okay, I'm gonna flip this over. And for the PC board we're going to be working on now, the main PC board, I want these screws to go into the eighth hole from the end. So one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. There's one. I'm now going to take our end piece, going to put the plastic insert in that end and the other plastic insert in that end. Okay, and I'm going to line this up right there. Turn it over and screw that into the plastic insert. Okay, there's one side done. Let's do the other. Again, I want the eighth position. Two, four, six, eight, this one. Okay, I'll screw that into position. Okay, there you see one stand is nice and sturdily installed. Let's do the other side. 
Okay, now the right side is installed. Let's try it out. Here's our PC board. Let me slide it into position. Now this side is fixed, but this side is spring-loaded, so you can sort of just pull that out. There you go. Look at that. Beautiful. Okay, now that we're done with our little carpentry project, let's get back to what you're really here for, building this board. Here's the completed main circuit board. Well, not quite complete. I'm still waiting for some parts to come in so I can complete this board. As you know, I test each part before I install it on the board. And when installing these four precision resistors, one, two, three, and four, they actually tested quite out of range. In fact, further out of range than many of these 5% resistors. The four precision resistors were supposed to be within 1%. Also, I left three of these ceramic caps uninstalled because I just want to show you a little something about those before I put them in. But no reason for this to hold us up. Let's move on and see what's next. You can see this was quite a long section. Okay, we'll be working on the control circuit board. And for that, we're going to need pack five, and I believe this comes in two bags. Let's see, pack number five, number two, and pack number five, number one. Let's pour these out, should fit in here. More controls and switches, bag number two. Ah, so you really got to look in these bags because sometimes in the folds on the bottom, resistors and things get caught. So it's a good idea to really double check. Um, that's why I don't throw these bags away until the kit is completely finished because uh, you never know, you might be throwing away a component that was stuck on the bottom. So hang on to those bags. Let's double check bag number one again. Reach in there, make sure there's nothing. Okay, seems good. And looks like we have the usual suspects, resistors, some NPN transistors, PMPs, more resistors, lots of electrolytic capacitors. Remember, these will not be used. I have new ones to use. We have quite a few of these Mylars. These should be just fine, as well as the ceramics. And let's see, we also have quite a few resistors, these precision capacitors, and some pin connectors. Let's set this aside. Okay, and we're going to need board 852050, which is the control circuit board, and I have that here. And you can see quite a few components on this board as well, so this will take some time. Let's build it.
Okay, I just want to give you a quick tip on adding jumper wires to these circuit boards. As you can see here, 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 and here, Heathkit has called for a jumper wire to be placed between um, these two points, these two points, these two points. So just connecting different points on the circuit board via a wire. And the way Heathkit recommends you do this, you can see in the instructions, they'll call for, for example, the one I'm working on now, one and one eighth inch uh, jumper wire, and they give you a ruler down at the bottom. And you know, you're supposed to cut the wire to size. I, I find this never works out. You always get a wire that's either too long or too short. So let me show you the way I do it. First thing I do is I take my jumper wire and I strip a piece off of the end, okay? You can use any strippers. These are the strippers that I prefer. And what I'm going to do now is I'm going to bend one end down. And you can see I haven't cut anything yet. I've just stripped off the end and I've bent it. I stick one end into the hole where the jumper is supposed to go. And then I take a Sharpie and I mark where we're going to strip the insulation from the wire and where it will bend to go into the through hole for the PC board. Okay, so I'll take that out. Now I have a mark here. Again, that's where we need to strip, but we need some excess lead. So you can give yourself a you know, quarter of an inch or so, whatever you need. Cut that off. Okay, so now we have that. Now, take your stripper and right on that line that you may strip it, take your needle nose pliers, bend it down. And now you're gonna see it's going to fit in there perfectly. And there you go, a nice little trick to make installing jumper wires quick and easy. I had to take a quick break from building our preamplifier to fix something that was driving me absolutely nuts. If you've been following my channel for a while, you may have heard me mention my Hakko fume extractor, and I turn that on while I'm soldering, and it basically pulls the smoke from the air while you're soldering. Now the main unit for the extractor sits under the bench, you can probably see it there. That includes the fan and the filters, and it connects to the top of your bench through this rigid yet flexible hose, this plastic tubing, and you, can, you see you can manipulate the, the nozzle where you want it. And I've also added this remote control. I'll turn it on. There you go. And it's just a little remote AC. It doesn't come with it. This is something I bought on Amazon separately. and allows me to turn the unit on up here on the bench. So I don't have to reach underneath the bench and turn it on and off. So very, very convenient. But the problem I've been having with this hose is it's just been slipping all over. I tried to keep it in place. And you may have seen this on, on the videos we've been doing. It's been uh, sort of a fast motion video. So you may or may not have seen it. But trust me, I've been struggling with this. So again, I put the brakes on everything and just made an attempt to see if I could get this to sit more uh, sturdily because as I said, it's sort of flopping over. Um, what I did is, I'm a cyclist and I use this product on um, carbon fiber components on the bike, particularly with the uh, seat tube. Sometimes with uh, if you have a carbon fiber seat post that goes into a carbon fiber frame, the carbon fiber tube will slip. With carbon fiber, you don't want to clamp it too much. So if you use this paste, which has sort of a grit to it, you, can, um, you don't have to clamp down quite so hard and uh, you can protect your carbon that way and the tube will actually will stop uh, slipping down. So I tried this and what I did is I put it in between here, more, more down, especially down at the bottom where all the weight is and a little bit around here and really work this grit in. Now it's a little bit oily, it's a little bit, uh, makes a little bit of a mess, but if you kind of wipe it off a little bit down here where you're going to be holding it so your hands don't get dirty and leave it a little bit thicker down there where the weight is, uh, it seems to be working pretty well. Let me show you. Now I can, this is what I was having the hardest time with, was having it stay in position there. It was kept falling down onto my PC board. Now I've heard a lot of uh, complaints about this product, that people like the, uh, they like the fume extractor, but they complain about this nozzle. So uh, the reason why I'm sharing, sharing this is because I know I'm not the only one that has this problem. So just a helpful tip, hope it helps you. And again, the product I use is called Fiber Grip. It's by Finish Line, and there may be other products available as well. And uh, this is a specialty item for bicycles. So any bicycle online retailer will likely have a product similar to this. All right, again, hope that helps. Uh, if any of you have been struggling with your uh, Hacko fume extractor, let's get on with our Heath Kit build.
What the heck am I doing? Have any of you ever used this technique before for ceramic capacitors? Let me know in the comments. Okay, for a little background on that, I wanna show you this Heathkit manual. This is for a model 9560 oscilloscope, a Heathkit oscilloscope that I built a couple of years ago. This model dates from the late 60s, and I wanna flip ahead and show you some of the instructions that it has for ceramic capacitors. Take a look at this note. It says, before you install disc capacitors, use long nose pliers to remove the excess insulation from the capacitor's leads. And there they show the pliers being used to indeed grind off that little bit of extra epoxy as I did. Now, the interesting thing about this advice is I haven't really been able to find it advised anywhere else. Here's the manual for our preamplifier and no mention of grinding the leads down of the ceramic capacitors. And I've looked at the manuals for a couple of other Heath kits I have, and again, no mention of that. Personally, I'm not really sure what the benefit of this is. When I built this kit, I did follow this advice, and I presume that Heath kit just wanted to keep the leads as short as possible. And, you know, by removing that little bit of excess epoxy, you sometimes can get the capacitor to sit more flush with the board. And perhaps with something like an oscilloscope, keeping that stray capacitance under control is important. But personally, I don't think that tiny benefit you may or may not even see is outweighed by the fact that you could damage the leads of this capacitor by breaking the seal. Uh, by breaking off this epoxy, you could be allowing ingress of moisture to get into the capacitor and do more damage over time. So again, in general, I don't recommend doing this. What about you? Is it a practice that you follow? Let me know in the comments. Okay, and there's one other thing I wanna show you with ceramic capacitors. Let me set this aside, and I'm going to get my capacitor meter out, and let's test the capacitance of this 10 picofarad ceramic capacitor. Now, this is rated for 10%, so our reading should be within 10% of 10 picofarad. Okay, 11 and a half picofarad. That's a little bit out. That's a little bit beyond 10%. Uh, getting closer to 12%. Now, does that mean this capacitor is no good? No, let me show you something. Let's move our leads up. Now watch what happens to the capacitance when I clip these leads down. Snip, snip. And you can see the capacitance has dropped significantly and our capacitor is now reading within 10% of 10 picofarad. So what was happening here is that these excess leads are actually acting as capacitors. So the tester wasn't just reading the capacitance of the body, but also the capacitance of these leads. And by clipping them off, it actually changed the reading quite significantly. Now, when measuring capacitors in the nanofarad or microfarad range, you're unlikely to see any difference by cutting off the leads. But as this is in the picofarads, we're measuring very, very tiny, tiny amounts of capacitance. Cutting off the leads can make a big difference. So before you throw away those ceramics, cut down those leads to see what the actual capacitance will be in circuit. So just another little tip for you. I just received the replacement resistors from Mauser, so we can now complete the build of our PC boards. Most of the resistors that came with the kit tested just fine, but uh, these guys, not so much. Every one of these that was included with the kit uh, tested out of spec. There were a couple of random values that gave me trouble, but in particular, I had problems with three specific types. And those were the 2.2 mega ohm resistors, quarter watts, the 80.6 1% resistors, and the 750 ohm 1% resistors. Just about all of these tested poorly, so these are the replacements. Let's do a quick test of one of the precision resistors that came with the kit, and let's compare it to one of the new ones from Mauser. Set these others aside, and let's look at a 750 ohm 1% resistor. Let's test the one that came with the kit first. Again, this is supposed to be within 1% of 750 ohms, and we have quite a bit higher at 771 ohms, almost 772. Okay, now let's check one of our new replacements from Mauser. And we have 751 ohms, so just about perfect. In addition to the resistors that came with the kit, there's one other component in our bad container, and that is this Nishikon electrolytic capacitor. Now, the interesting thing here is, this is actually a brand new capacitor. And as I've been saying all along, please double check all of your components, whether old or new, to save yourself some grief later. Let me show you how this brand new 
electrolytic Nishikon tests. Okay, this is supposed to be 100 microfarad, and you can see it's reading only in the picofarads. Let's also test it now with an ESR meter. And as you can see, the meter can't even detect this capacitor. It's so far out of value. And to compare, let's test this other Nishikon, which came from the same batch as this bad one. Again, brand new electrolytic capacitors. There you go, absolutely no problems. Now I've got to tell you, when I build electronics, I probably spend just as much time, if not more, testing components as I do installing them. And while this can be extremely time consuming while building the kit, it'll more than pay off later when it comes time to power up your equipment. Okay, let's finish up putting these boards together. Okay, finally, all of our PC boards are now assembled. This is the moving coil board, the mode selector board, the input selector board, the control board, the main board, the power supply board, and the speaker selector board. So now that our boards are done, we're ready to start putting this chassis together. Stay tuned for that in the next episode. To stay updated about when the next video will be released, please subscribe to my channel and click the bell to receive a notification. And if you like this video, please give it a thumbs up. I'll see you soon.